From the very beginnings of phone service, the problem of how to communicate properly using telephone technology has always been an issue. Early telephone books even offered advice for the clueless. Things as basic as how to answer the phone and how to pronounce numbers to avoid confusion. Since phone calls did not, at the time, sound crystal clear, there were guidelines about how loud to speak and the simplest but most important instruction, pay attention while on a call. Bringing rules from the home into the workplace could also cause all kinds of confusion. So the Bell system for decades made etiquette films for office workers on how to most politely use the telephone system. Telephone courtesy, made in the 1940s, is one of the campiest of those films, with lots of examples of extreme rudeness, like telephoning with a cigarette or toothpick in your mouth, followed by corrective behavior. In the modern era, the last time there was a flurry of attention paid to telephone etiquette was in the late 1990s and early 2000s, with the growth in the use of cell phones. Even the famous Emily Post, now of emilypost.com, weighs in on this issue with advice like, be in control of your phone, don't let it control you. It's taken a few years, but cell phones now have an unspoken set of rules especially regarding use in public spaces or during meetings. Hello? Uh, but we don't always follow them. And now, telephone courtesy. Four gross last month. And a gross here, 14. Okay, okay, I can hear you. I guess we can move it up until next week. Maybe. And I'm too busy to argue about it. What do you want? Huh? Well, he's not in. I don't know. Burton Supply Company. The accounting department? Surely. You're welcome. Stevens. Universal? No. I'm call today. I'll get them for you right away. How do you do? Would you tell Henry, I mean, Mr. Burton, that Mr. Hopper is here, please? Oh, yes, Mr. Hopper. He's expecting you. I mean, I think he's Johnson on long distance please. now. Well, that's quite all right. I'll wait. Care to see the paper? Mr. Johnson? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stevens calling. Just a minute. Burton Supply Company. Shipping room? Yes, sir, I'll do that. Burton Supply Company. Well, Mr. Lux is out of town today. Mr. Whiteside will handle that matter for you. Yes, sir, I'll connect you. You're welcome. Yes, Mr. Patterson? Oh, you'll be in the stock room? Surely, I'll transfer your calls to the stock room all day. Burton Supply Company. Mr. Wilson? Thank you. Mr. Burton's finished, Mr. Hopper. Go right in. Uh, how's that? You may go in now. Oh, thank you. Henry! Hello. Well, if it isn't Ted Hopper. How are things out on the coast? Great, great. Are you ready for lunch? Sure, Ted. As soon as I take care of one more telephone call. Should be in any time now. Here, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Ah, thanks. Cigarette? Sure. Well, Ted, it's good to see you again. Say, what sort of magic do you work around here? <laughs> Same old Ted, always talking in riddles. What do you mean, magic? I'm no Houdini. You must have something to lure that gal here. 
The one who runs your switchboard out there. Oh, you mean Miss Tanner? I don't know what her name is, but that girl sure knows how to handle a switchboard. Yep, she's good, all right. Still the master of understatement, aren't you, Henry? Yeah, she's good, all right. Where did you get her? She's the same operator we've had all along. Yeah? Hmm. Hmm. Sounds like you've been impressed. You know what? I think I'll kidnap her. What for? What for? Because telephone habits in my office could stand a shot in the arm, that's what for. Well, aren't you worried about my wanting your gal? Look, Ted, just stealing my switchboard operator won't solve your telephone problems. Or anybody else's, for that matter. That's all. <laughs> Says who? My switchboard operator sounds good, and is good. But the rest of my organization is good, too. They're just telephone-wise. Telephone-wise? What's the magic formula? Look, I told you before, there's no magic at all. It's very simple. It all started several months ago, when I was very anxious to get to the office early one morning. I had an important business conference coming up. A miserable day for my car to break down. Of course, with the rain, all the taxis were taken. So, about the only thing to do was call the office. Hello? Well, it's about time. Get me Bill Johnson. Who? What do you want? I said get me Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson! Oh, uh, just a minute. Who'd you want? Mr. William C. Johnson. Johnson of the accounting department. And don't take all day. Oh, Johnson. I'll see if he's in. What do you mean, I'll see if he's in? Don't you know? Well, is Johnson in or isn't he? Oh, is this Mr. Burton? Yes! Uh, well, uh, yes, sir. I, I'll get Johnson. I mean, I'll get Mr. Johnson right away. Yes, sir. Well, it was a struggle, but I finally got Johnson, and he took care of the arrangements for the conference. But I started thinking things over. It's funny, always when I called before, I was treated like a king. But this time, she didn't recognize my voice at first. She was pretty indifferent, disinterested. I began doing a little supposing. Supposing all telephone calls at the office, particularly customers, got kicked around. Hmm. I wonder if that could have anything to do with our sales dropping off with Universal. Maybe Acme didn't call back last week because... Yeah. Right then and there, I decided to look into this telephone situation. At the office, my eyes and ears got a real workout. Thoughtless telephone habits all over the place. Although my employers didn't realize it. For example, customers were kept waiting forever, it seemed. Hello? This is Miss Gower from the Burton Supply Company. I just wanted to check with you about their oil. Some okay. garbled their conversation so much that even I couldn't understand them, let alone the customer at the other end of the line. Go ahead with it. Now, if we don't have these two things by this afternoon, I wish you'd check back with me. Yours of the fourth received comma, and subsequent orders will be shipped, commensurate with existing stocks, pursuant to our agreement as of the 12th period. Heretofore, we had adhered to our strict policy as outlined in our previous letter. Hello? Hello? Hmm. Guess they hung up. Well, couldn't have been very important. 
Now, let's see. Well, it didn't take much looking around my office to see we had a plain case of bad telephone manners. It began to worry me. Something ought to be done. But I was no expert on telephone manners. The telephone company. Hmm. Why, I must have passed this building a thousand times. It never entered my head to go in. But why not? Maybe they could help. Got nothing to lose. What did I mean, maybe they could help? Of course they could. They'd feel that's part of their job. I told them my story. Then I asked if I could borrow their ideas of good telephone manners. I got some booklets on telephone courtesy. And a representative from the telephone company came over to look around the office. He noticed a lot of thoughtless habits I had missed, including some of my own. And then, knowing what was wrong, I had confidence to go ahead. So you picked up a lot of pamphlets and stuff and put one in each pay envelope <laughs> as a surprise. Oh, Ted, I'm serious. As soon as I knew what the trouble was, I thought the best way to convince my people of proper telephone usage and the dividends it pays was to show them. So I put on a telephone show. <laughs> and now you're in the show business. <laughs> Henry Burton, the poor man Cecil B. DeMille. Joke all you want to, Ted, but that show got results. Held it in the stockroom. Actually, anybody could put on a show like mine, with a few desks and a couple of telephones. I called in my people and started with an important point which they hadn't realized. In a business like ours, telephoning is as important as personal visits of our salesmen. Good habits please our customers. Bad habits only irritate them. Telephone courtesy not only makes work easier, it makes our customers feel welcome and impresses them that we're glad to do business with them. Let's look at it this way. The telephone is meant to work for us. Yes, that's right, work for us. The important thing is knowing how to put it to work properly. Good telephone manners aren't difficult, they're easy and natural. Let's run through a few fundamentals. First off, when you're making a call, be sure you have the right number. Now, if you're not sure, look it up in your directory or your list of frequently called numbers. Saves loss of your time, avoids wrong numbers, and prevents the possibility of disturbing someone who is not at all interested in your call. Now, when you're going to dial a number, wait for the dial tone. You're all familiar with it. It's the hum you hear in the receiver, like this. This tone is the same as the operator saying, number please. It tells you the equipment is ready to handle your call. Now, if you start dialing before you hear that hum, you'll either get the wrong number or no number at all. So wait for the dial tone. It's another time saver. When it's necessary to signal the operator, do it this way, a definite rhythm. If you pump up and down impatiently like this, about the only thing you're likely to get is high blood pressure. <laughs> It may sound queer, me telling you how to talk over the telephone, but it's surprising how many of us make careless mistakes. Here's what I mean. Speak clearly in a conversational tone, like this. Directly into the mouthpiece. Try to avoid talking too fast, and by all means, never talk with anything in your mouth, or you'll sound as if you have a mouthful of mush. The Chelsea department store, send me over four prefabricated houses right away. <laughs> Well, you get the idea. It's the same with pipe, chewing gum, or cigarettes. They clutter up your speech and make you hard to be understood. And worst of all, it's very rude. Let's take an incoming call all the way through, from beginning to end. Of course, it's just common sense to be ready for a call at all times. Pad and pencil go with the telephone just as cheese goes with apple pie. If you have these handy, you won't have to hunt all over the place for something to write on when you're in the middle of a call. And by the way, it's a good habit to take notes on telephone conversations because they'll serve as reminders for you. Now we're ready for an incoming call. Answer your telephone promptly, before the second ring if possible. If your phone rings on and on six or eight times, the caller can easily get the idea that we're not interested in his call. And besides, you all know how that endless ringing of somebody else's phone disturbs you then answer by identifying yourself and the office if necessary. Don't just say hello. It's old-fashioned and 
wastes time. Now, you all know what I mean. Hello? Oh, hello. Who's calling? Well, what number is this? Well, what number are you calling? Well, I'm calling your number. Oh, is that you, Myrtle? Yes, who's that, Hortense? Yes, this is Hortense. Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> Well, you, you see what I mean. Now, the right way to answer your telephone is... Well, you've all noticed how the Acme people handle their calls. Credit Department, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Andrews' office, Miss Carter speaking. Just like that, and I know you've seen it happen many, many times. That's the quickest way to let the customer know who's answering and how to continue his conversation. But no matter whose phone you're answering, your own or anybody else's, always make your customer feel that you're interested in his call. Be obliging and polite. Then, when you're sure he's finished, bring the conversation to a definite, courteous close, like this. Yes, that's fine. Thanks for calling, Mr. Frisbee. Goodbye. A pleasant thank you, goodbye, is much better than hanging up, maybe while the other party is still talking or listening. It's just being considerate. Oh, yes, and when you hang up, put the telephone securely on its base, making sure it rests squarely on the cradle. See that there are no books or other objects in the way. You'd be surprised how these suggestions for proper telephone usage add up to make your working day more enjoyable. Is there anything special for long-distance calls, Mr. Burton? The same simple rules apply. However, there's one thing particularly important for out-of-town calling. If for any reason your call doesn't go through right away, stay near your telephone until it does go through. Thank you. If you must leave your office, let the operator know where you can be reached and when you expect to be back. Or leave a note by your telephone explaining where you are, like this. Making a habit of telling the switchboard operator where you are is a good idea, whether you expect a call or not. Then she won't have to hunt all over the place for you when you're out of your office. Now, here's a time saver. Keep information handy, so you won't irritate customers by keeping them waiting while you leave the telephone and work yourself into a lather hoping to find what you're looking for. Well, that might be a good system, Mr. Burton, but I can't possibly pile 15 or 20 filing cabinets on my desk just for telephone calls. <laughs> it's quite possible. You can't have everything at your fingertips. But here's how to handle a call like that. All right, Mr. Whiteside, if you'll help me out, we'll show them. Burton. Whiteside of Universal Calling. Could you give me the complete figures on our last year's purchases? Be glad to, Mr. Whiteside, but that'll take a few minutes. Do you prefer to wait, or shall I call you back? Well, I am pretty busy at the moment. Call me back, please. As soon as I have the figures. Your number is? Dawson, 8. One, two, three, seven. Dawson, eight. One, two, three, seven. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. When a customer calls wanting detailed information that takes you away from the telephone, ask him if he prefers to wait or be called back. Then be sure you have his correct telephone number. All of this makes it easier for you and serves our customers better. Now, this next may seem far-fetched, but it's really quite a serious time and energy waster. Miss Barclay and Mrs. Carey, please. Thank you, Mr. Whiteside. That'll be all. The importance of answering your own telephone yourself is... Well, see for yourself. Yes, sir? Get me Mr. Blackwell at Acme. Yes, sir. Give me Mr. Blackwell. Well, who's calling? What difference does it make who's calling? Give me Mr. Blackwell. Well, I have to know who's calling. Mr. Burton's calling. Well, put Mr. Burton on and I'll connect you. No, you put Mr. Blackwell on first. Well, who does Mr. Burton think he is? And who does Mr. Blackwell think he is? Now, listen here. You put him on the line, all right? Listen, sister. You're Mr. 
Burton isn't so okay, hot. All right, all right, all right, girls. We're convinced. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> So you see, it is pretty obvious that answering your own telephone in person is a good habit. Now, Miss Boyd, we're ready for you. Miss Boyd will help me show you how you can get gray hair in one easy lesson through the irritating practice of being transferred from one office to another. Miss Boyd. <sighs> That's about it. Uh, we're going to need all those figures immediately. You're speaking to the wrong department, ma'am. How's that? I said you're speaking with the wrong department. I'll transfer you to... You mean I'll have to explain this again? The whole routine? That's right. Mr. Williams handles things like that. Oh, all right. Put him on. Now, if you'll imagine it's 20 minutes later, we'll see how Miss Boyd is making out. But I've already explained what I want to Mr. Marshall and Mr. Thomas and Mr. Green. You're not the one either? No, that's Mr. Wilbur's problem. He may be back later. Call then. After all this mix-up, call again. Listen, I wouldn't call your place if... Thank you, Miss Boyd. <laughs> All of that heartbreaking struggle can be avoided. If you can't handle a call yourself, make sure you transfer your customer to the proper department or office, like this. I'm sorry, Mrs. Maxwell, but Mr. Johnson will handle that for you. Would you care to speak with him? I'll be glad to have your call transferred. It's just as easy as that. Just be sure your caller is transferred to the right party. It saves so much time and energy for you and the customer. Now, the most important consideration of telephoning, how your voice sounds on the other end of the line. Every time you talk on the telephone, the customer has some kind of mental picture of you. Now, if your voice personality is dull and lifeless, like this, hello, in his imagination, you'll probably look like this. And the customer will feel you just aren't interested in his call. Or that you work for a business that's something close to this. One of the best ways to make a good impression on a caller is to speak with a smile in your voice. An interested voice, combined with proper telephone usage, is like offering a warm handshake over the phone. And with it, you'll appear like this to your callers. Our business, more like this. Just by a sparkle in your voice. Something like this. Accounting department, Mr. Stevens. When the show was over, the comments were interesting. You know, the boss said a mouthful. That stuff will save a lot of wear and tear on the customers. Yeah, and on poor little me, too. Thanks. Sounds as easy as, as walking. Yeah, I know. Yes, sir, Ted. That show got us off on the right foot. Sounds reasonable. But did the show alone do the trick? For instance, did it change your switchboard operator into a mild sensation? Well, that was part of it. The rest was making sure she had a chance to be a switchboard operator. How could I expect her to be a mild sensation, as you call it, with typing and filing and receptionist duties, in addition to her switchboard? The girl had too much to do. A PBX instructor from the telephone company came over to study Miss Tanner's situation. Then her work was arranged so she could devote her attention exclusively to the switchboard. Now she's a welcoming committee of one. For incoming or outgoing calls, her appeal is evident in just a few words. Burton Supply Company. Mr. Wilson? Yes, he is. Just a moment. Burton Supply Company. The shipping room? I'll connect you right away. There you are, sir. And by the way, a business that's telephone-wise not only treats the callers right, but makes sure the customers have its telephone address. Well, now I've heard everything. What is this mysterious telephone address? Nothing mysterious. The telephone number of an office is just as important as the street number. So I have it printed where it can't be missed. On our letterheads and bill forms, even on our business cards. You see, that's our telephone address. Well, now say that that looks like a good idea. It may sound like I'm making a big issue out of a little thing, but we have found that telephone courtesy is made up of a lot of little things. It's a cooperative effort by all of us in the office. 
That's why you won't solve your problems just by stealing my switchboard operator. Beginning to make sense, all right. Our organization is doing a better telephone job now because it's easier. And we enjoy it. We're working as a team. I see what you mean, Henry. But doesn't the gang forget? I mean, well, you know, slip back into the old habits occasionally. Sometimes they do, yes. Naturally, my show wasn't enough to cure old habits. So I just followed through with what I started. Regular checkups and suggestions. It wasn't long, though, till the simple, easy things that make up telephone courtesy, prompt attention, thoughtful consideration, effective action on our customers' calls, became second nature with us. Ah, there it is. That must be my long-distance call. Excuse me, Ted. Sure. Burton. Yes, I'm ready. And Ted, to help keep us from slipping back into old habits, we have this reminder in front of us all the time. Thank you.